Where, oh, where is the business of podcasting headed? And marijuana entertainment value gets high. You see what I did That's there, That's another Tom? good one. I, it's just, <laughs> you're, too, you're too much. <laughs> this is episode 70 of Media Unplugged, the podcast that goes behind the spin to reveal what's really happening in media. Media Unplugged with Tom A. Sacker and Mark Ramsey. Welcome to Media Unplugged. I'm Mark Ramsey. And I'm Tom Asacker. And our thoughts and prayers go out to all of our friends and family in Texas and my birthplace, Louisiana. I never would have guessed you're from Louisiana, Tom. You can't tell by the accent. Yeah, I know. (laughs) Maybe the far northeastern New England part of Louisiana. Well, go to New Orleans and you'll see. They they sound like me down there. Uh, Yes, but to your point, yes, uh, our hearts and prayers go out to the folks in uh, Houston and Louisiana. Um, where's the business of podcasting headed, Tom? Um, this actually was one of those rare topics that came from uh, a listener. Uh, we got a note from the listener, and the note, I'll just summarize, it said basically this. Um, this is someone who works in the radio space, and which is also, of course, the podcasting space nowadays. And the question was, okay, Intercom purchased, Intercom, a radio broadcaster, purchased a 45% stake in a company called Digital Media, which is digital without the I, without the first I. Is that Confusing enough? Yes, confusing enough. (laughs) (laughs) Well, get this. Okay, it's going to get more confusing because they changed the company's name to Cadence 13. Well, because of the merger with CBS? I don't know why. They changed it to Cadence 13. People like to change the names of things. I don't know. I think Cadence 13 is, uh, I don't, you know, I don't, if you were to ask me, name a name that is not memorable, I would come up with Cadence 13. (laughs) And I keep thinking of Dementia 13 for some reason, which would have been a vastly more memorable name. <laughs> Ironic, anyway, ironically. <laughs> Intercom did not disclose the terms of the deal. It's believed to be a combination of cash and in kind. They, he talked about uh, Gimlet, another podcasting company, raising $15 million from VCs, which is not a lot of VC money, as we know. Uh, these investments follow Hubbard, another broadcaster's investment for a 30% stake of Podcast One and another podcasting platform. Uh, Ten days before Scripps purchased Midroll, another podcasting platform that's home to a bunch of uh, well-known shows. And, of course, uh, and of course uh, 20th Century Fox invested in uh, Wondery, which is the podcast company that I have some dealings with, headed by a former Fox uh, employee. Um, his point is, from a financial perspective, these investments are in the tens of millions of dollars, not the billions of dollars TV acquisitions are fetching. They also show, show a less enthusiastic interest in podcasting from VCs. Nonetheless, there's there's a lot of interest and investment in the space by traditional radio companies. Traditional radio companies do tend to be diving into this space. They're uh, purchasing podcasting expertise and assets to leapfrog into the digital arena. They've decided it's cheaper, faster, and easier to buy into the technology than to build it in-house. What should we make of all this? So I'll start. Okay. (laughs) Um, Well, first of all, um, the money's certainly not big from a VC standpoint. That we know. That shouldn't diminish the the potential for the space. The money's not big from the VC standpoint because the VCs don't – the VCs look at the metrics in the space, which are rudimentary at this point. That's evolving. The VCs also look at the space and say, well, where's the – where's the – proprietary tech. Mm. There's no proprietary tech in the space. So what am I really investing in? I'm investing in your uh, potential to build a hit show and, uh, you know, generate uh, excessive ad ad dollars, I guess. Well, that's worth millions. That's not worth billions. Um, That's one thing. So I think the metrics are definitely immature. Apple's in the process of upgrading that. Apple is still the platform on which most of this content is distributed or at least consumed. Uh, The podcasting tech itself is kind of problematic in that um, if you compare the ease of use and ubiquity and familiarity of podcasts with any other audio platform, especially radio, uh, especially even Spotify. You know, you want a song on Spotify, you go to Spotify, you've got that song. Um, who knows even where to begin with podcasting? When you say podcast to someone who doesn't consume podcasts, they'll say, um, I don't even know where to begin. Why do I need that? I'm just a music fan. That's why I use Spotify. I actually had this situation. I was in a, uh, a lift uh, the other day, and here's someone millennial-aged, all wired up with all the gadgetry she needs to function uh, with Lyft. <laughs> and I say, I notice you're listening to the radio, which, by the way, 95 out of 100 Lyft and Uber drivers are listening to the radio. 
uh, yeah, I, I listen to podcasts every once in a while. And I said, well, why do you choose what you choose? And she said, well, a friend of mine has one and he turned me on to it. Well, <laughs> that only gets you so far, Tom. Um, that will help explain why, based on Edison media statistics, monthly usage for podcasts is supposedly 24% of America. Um, weekly usage is only 15%. And understand how low that bar is. That means if you listen to at least one podcast in a week, you qualify to be in that 15, 1-5% of America. So there's a lot of frequency going on for the people who consume content, uh, podcasts, but it's still, the reach is still not that great, I would argue. Um, so there's, and that's because it's confusing, there's, the tech is, is rudimentary, et cetera. Um, so those are at least, a, I have some more, but I want to start there and, and give you a chance to pipe in. Yeah, what I find interesting is, so this, this Lyft driver was listening to traditional radio. Now, this person had a newer model car, right, as my guess? Yes, they all, they all pretty much have late model cars. Yeah, yeah, they do. So they probably have Bluetooth, right? Mm -hmm. So they could listen to a podcast or stream something through Bluetooth on their phone. Uh, Bluetooth or cable. The woman, in fact, said to me, we didn't talk about Bluetooth, but she said, yeah, I don't even have the cable in the car. <laughs> you see, what's interesting is, think if, if you want to talk about an opportunity lost, why doesn't Uber have Uber radio mm -hmm. and have every one of those cars playing through Bluetooth their branded station with, the, with brands that they sell? I mean, look at the attention that they have in all of these vehicles. Well, I guess thinking along different terms, I guess since uh, uh, every driver and every passenger has different tastes in music, the question would be, what if they had a network of stations, right, right. of channels? And uh, they could do some deal with a Pandora. They could do some deal. I mean, they've already done a deal with Spotify, from what I understand. But, and, and that allows, uh, but I'll tell you, in all the cars I've been in, mm. I have yet to have a driver say to me, so what do you want to hear on Spotify, or do you want to use your Spotify hookup? And nobody has mentioned, so I've brought it up. No driver has ever brought it up. Yeah, you see, this is the most interesting thing to me about, about podcasting in general. I, I have read that most podcast listening isn't in the car, right? It's in the home. Well, I mean, what's going I don't know on? Any, do you I, know? I've seen that number. <laughs> yeah. I've seen that statistic, and... I have yet to encounter anyone who's seen that statistic who doesn't get utterly befuddled at that thought. And I think anyone who actually accepts that flat out um, is being too accepting because it doesn't sound right that so many people are listening to podcasts in their home. That doesn't sound like the behavior of people who listen to the podcast when you talk about when you talk to people who listen to podcasts. Right. So that statistic's probably wrong, I'm going to guess. Okay, because like I, I think I do probably 80% of my podcast listening on my commute. Yeah, you and me, right. and or in a gym, or well, on a run, exactly. you know, whatever. All right, well, listen, Mark, where is it going? I don't know because I still don't understand the business models. I mean, I understand the advertising business model behind what, what podcasters are trying to do. What I don't understand is how can you possibly create unique value around this. It, you know what it reminds me too, and, and, and you, you can help me here because listen, you're deep into the podcasting ecosystem, especially with you know, your, your recent hit podcast, Inside Psycho. Isn't there right. a parallel to what's happening in the film industry? I mean, you get too many studios producing too many films, which ends up cannibalizing each other's audiences. Isn't that what's going to happen in podcasting? Well, here's, I guess, the analogy. I'm glad you brought that up because I think here's the interesting analogy that it relates to film and television for that matter, which is everyone's plowing out more and more content, right? But why are they doing that? Not to fill their uh, distribution channel, to fill the spectrum or to give people choices. They're doing it because they're in desperate search of a hit. Mm -hmm. I mean, 16 million people saw the last episode of Game of Thrones across various platforms uh, last week, um, 16 million people. And the, and remember, um, HBO is a pay service. So those are 16 million people 
the vast majority of whom I'm guessing were related to someone who was paying for that content. Right. Um, so that's now to say that. So that's the value of a hit. In other words, is that it can get 16 million people to pony up. Um, <laughs> the challenge here is you don't decide to make a hit. The fact that Apple is going to spend a billion dollars on audio content or on rather video content does not imply that Apple's going to create a hit. I know. They hope they're going to create a hit, but you know what that billion dollars is worth if they don't create a hit? Yeah, I know. <laughs> a lot less than a billion dollars. Listen, in- and by the way, if they create a hit, it's worth a lot more than a billion dollars. I was just in Orlando uh, at the beginning of the week, and I asked, so when is uh, Star Wars Land or whatever it's called going to open at Universal Theme Park? Oh, it's uh, open this fall. And I said, that's just going to be so huge. <laughs> And it is because everyone's looking for a hit, Tom. It's already a hit. Um, because the hit, the, if you come up with a hit, um, then that hit is monetizable. Uh, this was one of the points I wanted to mention about the future of the podcast space is that more than anything, the value in this content is the value of the IP, the value of the intellectual property um, for licensing. Um, it took me, as you know, and I think I can say this, an extra four to six weeks to do the deal for the second season of my podcast, not because I was negotiating for more money, but because I was negotiating for more rights. Right. Yep. <laughs> so, and then you look at um, uh, just a couple days ago, uh, Amazon released the trailer for Lore, which is the, uh, the uh, video version of the uh, popular podcast by the same name. And that comes out this October. Um, there it is. There's a popular podcast that somehow made its way to a television network, if we call Amazon that. And um, boom, that's the exercise of intellectual property. That is the big win. The big win is not doing spots for stamps.com. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah. That's the challenge. So that's one thing. The other thing relating to advertising, if it's not IP and it is advertising, the question is, well, what about native ads? You know, what about podcasts pre- created for partner brands? Um, that's really a space that's only beginning to burgeon, only beginning to grow. I think it's going to increasingly grow because ultimately, uh, I think if we're limited only to the idea that, you know, adver- a, a small selection of uh, performance-based advertisers want you or me, the host, to read the spot l- aloud and that that endorsement constitutes the end-all and be-all of advertising in the podcast space, uh, that ain't going to take you far. No. That ain't going to take you far. I mean, right now, just for uh, statistics' sake, uh, the podcast space this year is estimated to be about $220 million compared with about half that last year. Uh, They say, various estimates say, within the next three years, it could be double this. Um, But who knows, right? It's growing and in terms of audio, where's the space going? It's growing. It's growing modestly, but there's some hurdles ahead. And those hurdles are that the growth, that the upside in advertising is only so great. And by the way, if you're getting money in advertising for podcasts, a lot of that money is going to come from the coffers that had previously been devoted to other audio platforms. And the largest advertising audio platform is radio. So to some degree, the broadcasters that are getting into this space are, you know, planning to move money from one pocket into the other. Um, but moving money from one pocket into the other is better than watching it fritter away to somebody else. <laughs> yeah, listen, I just don't... I see the opportunity for someone who's passionate about you know, doing what they're doing and hopefully growing an audience and figuring out how to sustain it and keep attention over time. I mean, you know how difficult that is. I mean, it, it doesn't seem like some big growth industry that... that, that people are going to get hooked to because attention is just bouncing all over the place. I mean, to podcasts seem like carnivals that move into town. You know, if they can draw in enough people to make money, they keep going. But even then, after a while, people eventually tire of it. I, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's so, it's so funny you say that because I was just reading a piece from, because uh, now there's this whole field of expert millennial experts who are 20 years old. <laughs> and one of them was asked, well, what do you say about kind of the, crisis in attention span, the declining attention span among millennials. And her answer was, oh, no, no, no. It's the problem. It's not that attention spans are declining. It's that when we try a new app or something, the novelty wears off quickly. <laughs> and I said, I said to myself, isn't that exactly the same thing? 
Well, to me, that's the biggest challenge of, of scaling this type of industry and business. It's just that the attention that's, spans... I mean, look, I, I, uh, I googled great TV series on Netflix yesterday, and the first article that popped up said, the 75 best TV shows on Netflix right now. Oh, my gosh. Right. So, so that's 75. The only reason that Netflix works is because of their aggregation model, right? Just mm -hmm. like Amazon. So maybe if you do a podcast aggregation model, maybe it works. But a lot of these podcast listeners, you know, they have particular interests. And advertisers today are trying to find and match interests with what they're putting out there. So we'll see. We will see indeed. We will see indeed. You are listening to Media Unplugged with Tom Asecker and Mark Ramsey. Marijuana entertainment value gets high. Tom. Yes. Um, this is from a piece in um, The Wrap. And I just love this title. High Times Magazine worth as much as Washington Post was when Jeff Bezos brought it, <laughs> bought it. Uh, it was just so funny. So um, High Times is preparing to go public. We all know High Times. Some of us remember High Times. I remember seeing it in bookstores, you know, and just be, being puzzled. I've been puzzled over High Times for generations, okay? <laughs> With a valuation of $250 million, the same amount Jeff Bezos paid for the Washington Post in 2013, there's no guessing whether the Post has increased or decreased in value since 2013, but it may well have climbed since it's skyrocketing web traffic and subscription growth, etc. Um, High Times entered into, into an agreement to merge with publicly traded special purpose acquisition company, Origo Acquisition Corp. What the heck is that? <laughs> A publicly traded special purpose acquisition. That sounds like a shell of a shell of a shell. Uh, in a move that would take the magazine public and, and that values its existing equity at $250 million. Um, now, here's where it gets interesting. The publication, which relocated to L.A. from New York last year, owns 420.com, of course, hightimes.com, and cannabiscup.com, and has built properties around them. The company is also launching, here it comes again, a podcast network filled with comedians and industry experts covering cultivation, finance, and everything in between. About 70% of their users connect with the company via mobile devices, giving it a younger demographic than the aging hippies who started reading it when it launched in 1974, I might add. The outlet also generates the majority of its revenue from live events, <laughs> which I thought was fascinating. High Times laid out a uh, growth strategy, including leveraging its brand through licensing opportunities, expanding its events business, and using its digital presence to drive e-commerce and data collection. In other words, Tom, High Times is going to be everything except a magazine, <laughs> and its whole value, it's like the, the value of the brand name is, is, is universal. It's funny. I was watching TV the other night, and there was one of those infomercials on. It was like for some... Stupid gadget from Bell and Howell. You remember Bell and Howell? Yeah. That was one of those brand names from like 30 years ago that was like, I guess, a f photography brand yeah, or something. Yeah, I thought they were like a helicopter or something. <laughs> I don't, but Bell and Howell, you know, obviously decided that they were going to do what Kodak is doing. And there's just going to be a licensing name from now on. Do what the Trump brand is doing. Right. It's just licensing. So the value in the brand is purely, oh, I recognize that brand name. That must be a good brand. Yeah. So I found this so fascinating, didn't you? Listen, I see the p growth potential here more than I do in, in that last segment that we talked about. Because in the last mm -hmm. segment, it was all over the place. It's like mm -hmm. podcasts. What does that mean? Who's the audience? What's the identity play? How do you grow it? Where's the content? You know, I look at this, and High Time started as a joke when I was in high school. <laughs> It was a joke. They they did one. I think they they lampooned Playboy by substituting pot for sex, right? Like in the mm. centerfold, it would be a picture of a pot plant, and <laughs> no, that's what it was. It was a big joke, and I, and I think they funded the magazine from a, from illegal drug trafficking. But anyway, I would imagine. So, but so let's rewind for a minute though, because you know this looks strange now, but it's not going to look strange a hundred years from now. In, so it's 1920-something in the United States, right? Alcohol is illegal. Criminal gangs have control of the beer and liquor supply. So, sounds familiar? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, fast forward one generation since the end of Prohibition. 
The beer and liquor sales in the United States is around $300 billion right now. So desire unleashed. Now there's a desire to get a piece of the projected exploding action of legalized cannabis. I, the mm -hmm. desire for information, the desire to understand the business ins and outs, the desire to advertise and to sell to like newly liberated right. masses. Even Netflix, mm -hmm. I sent you something that said that they're playing mm -hmm. around with developing marijuana strains based on original shows. <laughs> right now it's a marketing well, stunt. Right? Yeah. But it's a sign of the broader acceptance we can expect to experience nationwide. There's no doubt in my mind. Absolutely true. And I think the other thing that's interesting that relates to to our previous conversation is these guys, the problem with podcasting is that it starts from the frame of reference of an industry called podcasting. Compare that to High Times, right. which starts from the frame of reference of a brand with demonstrated desire. Exactly. Right? Exactly. By so built around identity, start, right? <laughs> you start from the brand, not from the platform. So people are saying, how can I make money on my podcast? Rather than saying, what is it that people desire? And how can I give that to them? And oh, by the way, does a podcast manifestation make sense? I mean, these guys didn't start by saying we're going to build a, a podcast platform for high times. The podcast platform is an extension of the desire for the fundamental brand and that which the brand represents. You, right? you have got it. They found an audience. This has been legitimized through legislation. And now they say, how do we serve them? Online content, podcasts, events. We've been talking about this. It's all mm -hmm. around the audience and the identity and how you grow with that audience by giving them more and more of what they want. And here again, I think, is the nub of this piece where it says leveraging brand through licensing opportunities, expanding its events business, and using its digital presence to drive e-commerce and data collection. Why data collection, Tom? Because you know you, you have, you're building a platform so that you can serve these people. And because you probably will be selling that information oh, to someone who wants to use <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah, so it said that, and by the way, you can insert any valuable brand in here and wrap that sentence around it. The challenge isn't to wrap that sentence. The challenge is to have the valuable brand in the first That's place. That's it. You got it. <laughs> All right, time, uh, time. it's Tom for Rants and Raves time. <laughs> <laughs> I told you that you're not supposed to do this high times, you know, test. I know. While we're we shouldn't. We shouldn't do these recordings at 4:20, right? Exactly. All right. Actually, it is, isn't it? Exactly 4:20, it, it almost is. your time. It, it is. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right, so I'll go, I'll oh, go. I don't know what this is, a rant or a rave or what, but so you, there's a new movie coming out next week that has a group mm -hmm. of professionals outraged over the potential fallout. And, and you know what it is, because I know you love this stuff. It's the 2017 remake of It, which is based on the <laughs> Stephen King novel. So, <laughs> sure. so it premieres on September 8th, and America's Clowns, say the new It film is costing them money. Pam Moody, <laughs> I know, Pam Moody, the World Clown Association president, told The Hollywood Reporter that the chronic fear of clowns is unfair, at least oh. in comparison to fellow costume performers who dress as Father Christmas or the Easter Bunny. This is, I'm quoting her, quote, <laughs> please understand just because someone wears a rubber Halloween mask, that does not make one a clown. The horror movie character Jason wears a hockey goalie mask, but people wouldn't be mistaken, would be mistaken if they actually thought he was a hockey player. We disavow any relationship with these horror characters. Now, Mark, in anticipation of the potential downturn in clown demand, the World Clown Association has released a helpful guide for its members on how to survive the clown recession. It's titled WCA Stand on Scary Clowns. <laughs> now, the good news for the clowns is that on September 9th, Alamo Draft House will unveil it in a special screening for clowns only. Oh, isn't that nice? So that's nice anyway. That Alamo Draft House really knows marketing. They always do a great <laughs> they job. Do. By the way, wouldn't you think that it wouldn't be it that would be so uh, uh, be so bad for the business of clowns. Maybe it would be like the 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 collected history of John Wayne Gacy that would be well, maybe yeah, worse that for clowns. Could be part of it too. <laughs> 
Uh, well, I've got a couple this week. Uh, first one is, um, are you familiar with the uh, Gwyneth Paltrow's, you know, ever, all the stars now want to have their own brands oh, yeah. that they get behind? Oh, yeah. uh, do you know about Gwyneth Paltrow's? I've read about it. I, but fill me in again. It's called, it's called Goop. Uh, and the title of this piece from Publishing Insider says, Paltrow's goop slammed for promoting dubious health claims. Now, why would you expect a product called goop to be dubious in his health claims, Tom? I don't know. So here's how it begins, with tongue properly inserted in cheek. Brace yourselves for a terrible shock, everyone. Celebrities may endorse products without knowing what they really do or if they do anything at all. Goop has promoted a number of products as having healthful, healing, ameliorative, or otherwise positive properties with no basis in fact. And it goes through the list, and the list is just unbelievably long. First, Gwyneth ruined Coldplay. Now she's ruining Goop. <laughs> it's just not fair. Uh, this is my favorite part, though. This organization that uh, is criticizing them also took issue with Goop's endorsement of, quote, earthing, end quote. Do you know what that is? No. Walking barefoot to treat various ailments, including arthritis, insomnia, and depression. That's called earthing. Asked about, <laughs> asked about earthing, the earthing claim by talk show host Jimmy Kimmel, Paltrow, who founded Goop in 2008, explained, quote, there's some sort of electromagnetic thing that we're missing. It's good to take off your shoes in the grass. Does earthing work on, on like, pavement? <laughs> <laughs> pavement is the antithesis of well, earthing. Well, it just said bare feet. It didn't say on soil. Oh, there's nothing earthing about right, pavement, I'm Tom. Sorry, I'm sorry. All right, I have another one that's interesting, too. And this one is, is just as peculiar. And again, rant <laughs> rave. I think it's more of a rant. And the title is, Newspapers Highlight Roll with Blank Pages. Newspapers around the world have resorted to a dramatic form of non-statement, the blank front page, to protest censorship and other threats to press freedom. Now, Tom, conceptually, if your problem as a uh, product <laughs> is that nobody's reading you, What's wrong with this scenario? Look, I'm trying to picture people picketing with blank signs. I, I, I just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not seeing this. <laughs> What's wrong with this scenario is that if you're not reading the newspapers, and the, <sighs> then nobody sees, then you're not going to see the page. protest, Tom. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if you say, "Oh yeah, well you're going to ignore me," well I'm going to disappear, <laughs> and let's see how you like that. This week, more than 200 local newspapers in Minnesota and North Dakota employed the same eye-catching tactic to highlight the importance of newspapers to their local communities. That's, that's and funny. you can now insert Minnesota, North Dakota joke here, right? No, I like that. The blank front page stunt was orchestrated by local publishing trade organization, the Minnesota Newspaper Association, to commemorate its 150th anniversary. It comes amid mounting concern about long-term viability, et cetera, et cetera. Um, here's something that's in the, uh, I guess, I, I don't know where this happens. It must be after the blank page because they do have some editorial. It says, where would residents turn for reliable information? Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat? Be serious. We all know these sites are great for sharing photos and family anecdotes, but they cannot compete with a local newspaper for sound professional journalism and advertising trustworthiness. Oh, boy. Tom, the last three words of that were the ones that stood out to me. Oh, advertising man. trustworthiness. Unbelievable. I wasn't aware that newspapers had more trustworthy advertisers than social media. Did you know that? Um, I think they mean they select which ones. And, <laughs> oh, and no, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> so that's Media Unplugged for this week. Please remember to subscribe to us at iTunes or on Stitcher or wherever. And while you're there, please rate the show. It helps other folks discover us. And we want you to love us. We really do. Uh, you can also catch us at Art19.com, Radio Inc., Media Village and Google Play Music. By the way, Tom, did you know Media Village has their own podcast now? I do. I do. It's, I, yeah, yeah, it's good. They, uh, we're getting a lot more listeners from what I can tell. Yeah, but don't go to MediaUnplugged.net this week because we're going to take down the front page. It's going to be blank. Yeah, it's going to be blank just to make a point. <laughs> you can follow Tom on Twitter at Tom Asacker and Mark at Mark Ramsey Media. Send us your questions and comments using hashtag Media Unplugged. If there's a media topic you want to cover, you want us to cover, tweet us. That gentleman did. Catch up on older episodes at our website, MediaUnplugged.net. Special thanks to the amazing producer of Media Unplugged, Jeff Schmidt, who's very busy right now. Exciting, exciting audio from media. You can find him at Jeff-Schmidt.com, and he's never too busy for your project, never. I might tell you. For Tom Asecker, I'm Mark Ramsey. Thank you for listening. 